thank you for joining us today on Coffee With. We are, we've moved our location a little bit uptown and we are with Senator Briggs Hopson at his office. Um, Briggs, thank you for joining us today for, on Coffee With. Glad to be um, with you, Robin. Well, I appreciate you inviting us here. And Of course, a lot of people don't know we're taping this very early in the morning because your schedule is crazy, and I don't need to tell you that, do I? No, not at all. <laughs> Yours is crazy, too. I guess works well for both of us. Well, thank you for inviting us here. I really appreciate it. Um, of course, we want to talk about the flood, but we'll get to that. It's, you know, the topic of the day and the week and the hour and the month and, the and everything else. That's right. But um, I want to talk a little bit about you before we get to that topic. Now, you're a homegrown boy, right? I am. Born and raised. Well, actually, born in Memphis. My father was in medical school in Tennessee. Uh, but we moved here when I was a baby. I was one year old and moved to Vicksburg. And so all I know is Vicksburg as far as my childhood. And so I consider myself a Vicksburger through and through. Well, I understand that you weren't able to go to LSU and you had to go. <laughs> <laughs> had to suffer and go to that school up north. In That's right, right. So you went to Ole Miss for undergraduate I school. I did. And then to law school. At Ole Miss also. Seven good years. I can tell you, I had a, a in the, the time that I finished undergraduate and was looking to go to law school, and I looked at a couple of other law schools, but uh, Oxford was such a great place. And even though I was kind of tired of school, but uh, my father did give me some good advice. He said, if you're going to go to law school, go ahead and do it now and get it over with. And I'm thankful that I took his advice and went straight on to law school and finished and started practicing law shortly thereafter. Yeah, then you never know the difference. That's Having to correct. go back and get back in that school mode is tough. He said that he had talked to several people that had tried to do that, and it was very difficult. Once you've been out working for a while, trying to get back into school and uh, you know staying up late on the books and in the books trying to study is difficult. It's and too hard. I was glad I did it straight through. So from Oxford, where did you go? I went to New Orleans um, in my third year of law practice. I mean, law school. I was offered a job from, with a firm in New Orleans and went to work there for three and a half years. It was great, great experience, good place to be when you're young and single. And yeah. uh, New Orleans has got the best food in the country, probably the world. And, uh, so great, those, those were pre-Alley days, right? That's, yeah, before my marriage, uh, certainly. I, now, I met my wife when I was in school, but we never went out there. Uh, I was in New Orleans practicing law and happened to run into her. She and some friends were in, in New Orleans having a um, weekend, a girls' weekend together, and we ran into each other and uh, shortly thereafter started dating. So you were in New Orleans for a few years. Yes. And then you and went, I went to, to Gulfport, Gulfport for three years. And practiced yes. in a firm there? I, I did. And what, what drew you back to Vicksburg? Well, this firm, and we're sitting in my firm's office right now, but uh, Landy Teller, who is a senior partner in this firm, had talked to me actually coming out of law school. He had asked me if I would be interested in coming back to Vicksburg. And at the time, I just didn't feel like it was the right time for me. Uh, but he talked to me again, <clears throat> and his son, Blake, whom you know, Blake, also contacted me and said, we need to talk to you about coming back to Vicksburg. And we ended up meeting that summer at the bar convention, and they talked to me some more about it and uh, decided to make the move back to Vicksburg. And so how long have you been back? I've been back here 15 years. And you're married to Allie, married to Allie. and y'all have three children. That's correct. Allie and I have been married for almost 16 years. Um, we got married when I lived in Gulfport, and then we've got a 14-year-old son, Liam, and Walt is my 12-year-old son, and Jane is my 8-year-old daughter. You're, all of your kids are cute, but I, I had the pleasure of sitting across from Jane at dinner one night in church, and she is <laughs> loaded with personality. Well, she's full of herself, I'm sure. <laughs> Now, you're about to finish up your first term as Senator of District 23. And what areas does that cover? That's all of Warren, all of Issaquina, and about a third of Yazoo County. And what made you decide to run for that Senate position? I had not been involved in politics and really not that interested in politics, uh, per se. I mean, I'm, I've always been interested in good government, but I never thought that I was interested in politics until uh, about a few years before I decided to run and, and, and I saw things that I didn't like, I saw some things that I did like and, and I felt like I was um, able and capable of offering myself to serve and there were some things that I felt like I could do and, and that's what I've tried to work on in my four years in the Senate and hope to continue to do it So you're running for, for more years. You're running for re-election yes, coming am. up shortly. 
Um, what are some of the things you think you've been able to accomplish in these last, the last four years and the first four years, sure. actually? Let, let's start with uh, fiscal matters, if we can. Uh, if, if you recall, my first year in office, we set aside some money in the rainy day fund. We filled up the rainy day fund. It had been depleted before that. And I'm very proud of the fact that we, and we held fast because there were a lot of people that weren't pushing to do that. They said, look, we've got the money. Let's spend it. And for those of us that said, no, we're not going to do that, we want to fill up this rainy day fund because eventually tough times are going to come and we may need it. So uh, we, we started off on the right path, and, and unfortunately the economy did go south. And uh, so I'm thankful that we were fiscally responsible and have been the four years that I've been there. We've been very fiscally sound. You look around this country and see other states that are struggling mightily with budgets. And we, you know, we have our difficulties, no doubt about it. But we have been responsible in the way we've spent our money. And it's been tough. It's difficult. We've had to make a lot of cuts, and, and people aren't always happy about it. But, uh, you know, we're, in, in my opinion, we're in the business of running a business. Mm -hmm. you know, government, to me, is, is like a business. You need to run it that way. You can't cash checks when you don't have the money in the bank. Uh, so I think fiscally, uh, fiscal responsibility has been one thing that I've been touting, and I think it, we've done a good job with that. And I can't take all the credit for that because there are others that are uh, helping to get that done. In the area of education, uh, a couple of things I'm very proud of and I'm proud to have been a part of, the Children First Act, I co-authored that bill, and that allows, uh, one, it allows uh, our school district, state Department of Education to take over failing school districts. Well, we just can't have districts in our state that are failing and right. not doing a good job. Second thing it does, it requires the students in the schools to make certain GPAs before they can participate in extracurricular activities. Um, I also worked hard and promoted a, what I call a dual track enrollment or career track enrollment bill for uh, high school education. We've got a lot of students who either don't want to go to college or don't have the aptitude to go to college. And we need to train those students to have a skill, a vocation that they can get out and get to work in. Uh, I do want to teach the basic reading, writing, and arithmetic, but I want them to have some kind of skill, whether it be electrical work or carpentry or mechanical work, where they can come out of high school, get a diploma, and go to work at a company. You know, we need that type of employment. We need people doing that. Um, Rob and I could go on for 20 or 30 minutes about some of the things that I'm proud of, but I don't want to monopolize the time. Uh, but those are just a few things, fiscal responsibility, education, uh, health care access. What committees are you on? I can, if you'll excuse me a second, because I've got a cold, but I'm going to get a swig of water. I'm on, uh, well, I'm vice chairman of Judiciary A, and that is the civil law part of the, the judiciary. And I've been the vice chairman of that for four years, uh, and that's a major committee in the Senate, mm -hmm. and I've been very pleased as a freshman to get named vice chairman of that major committee. Last year, I was named vice chairman of public health, which is another major committee. Uh, the previous vice chairman was Alan Nunley. Alan's the uh, new congressman, U.S. congressman, and when he left, uh, the lieutenant governor appointed me as vice chairman of that committee. So I've served as vice chair of two committees in my freshman term. Uh, I'm also on ports, marine resources, tourism, universities and colleges, uh, I'm on environmental committee, and I'm on uh, Judiciary B. I may be leaving out one right now. It's, uh, oh, Appropriations, which is another huge and difficult committee. Now, Briggs, it seems like, if I remember correctly, last fall is when you went on that whirlwind <coughs> tour. You were invited. I don't really remember exactly what that's about. Can you information about that, what that was, and how you were able to participate in that. Sure. That's, that's a group called the Legislative Leadership Institute, and I was fortunate to get selected. Uh, I was recommended by uh, Senator, President Pro Tem of the Senate, Billy Hughes. Uh, they had asked uh, four legislators from across the country to come on this trip, along with some uh, people from Europe and Africa, uh, to take a trip to understand different cultures, different governments, uh, different how to handle different crises and those kind of things. Just to give you a kind of a again, whirlwind, if you will, trip of what we've done, uh, we went to Africa and studied some emerging economies in Africa and we studied the genocide and 
things to do to prevent civil war and civil unrest in countries, um, and, and other things too, but those were kind of the highlights of that trip. We went to um, Switzerland and Ireland to study and look at some of the economic issues that they're dealing with in Europe right now. Of course, you know Ireland's in major financial trouble. Uh, we, we did a lot of study and debate on what happened. Mm -hmm. How do you get in that situation? Um, in Switzerland, we, we looked at a number of things, including um, United Nations, uh, World Health Organization issues. We looked at uh, CERN, the nuclear testing facility in the, in the uh, I don't know if you're familiar with CERN, it's the underground uh, radioactive underground uh, accelerator that uh, looks at how uh, the earth, how things change on the earth and how things, uh, how you have new galaxies and planets starting and things like that. You know, a little bit above my head, it's a little too scientific for me, but anyway, it's interesting uh, to learn about it. Uh, I also took a trip uh, about a year ago, about this time a year ago, to New York and D.C. with this group. Uh, we looked at uh, some other financial issues. We looked at what happened with 9-11 and how we can avoid terrorist attacks. We looked at uh, world financial crises um, in Washington. And I didn't get to make all that trip. And then we came to Gulfport and talked about how do you handle natural disasters. We talked about Katrina and Katrina response in Mississippi. and um, So those participants from other places got to see some of the things that we did in Mississippi mm -hmm. to handle that natural disaster. And here we are on the <clears throat> brink of another one, right. or in the midst of one, the, mm -hmm. as you look at the crest of the river and, you know, all the tragedy really that's surrounding us at this point. Um, and I know that from talking to Representative Alex Monsoor that you and Alex um, were kind of ahead of the game and did some kind of behind the scenes things. Tell me a little bit about that. When it first became apparent that the water was coming and it was coming in a mighty way down the river. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. You know, and, and let me tie that into what I was talking about handling natural disasters. One of the things that we learned is, is you as much as you can, you get out in front of a natural disaster. And so when you know something's coming, you make plans to coordinate your efforts because uh, what, what I've seen in my studies is that if you're not coordinated, you've got a, a mess. Mm -hmm. and, and we saw that a little bit in Katrina. We saw, I don't mean to criticize Louisiana too much, but we saw uh, a scattershot approach to handling a problem. And, and you've got to have your local, state, and federal governments, along with your relief agencies, you know, your Red Crosses and, and United Ways and Salvation Armies, working together and understanding what everybody's role is and having a central command. Um, one of the things that Alex and I did, and, we, and George Flags was also involved in the phone conferences, we knew this was coming. And so from a legislative standpoint, from a state standpoint, what do we need to do to make sure that we're doing everything possible? And we do know enough to know that MEMA, our Mississippi Emergency Management Agency, is the, is the coordinating agency for natural disasters. So um, our thought was, let's get with MEMA. Uh, let's talk to them about how they want to coordinate the state effort. Uh, MEMA, in turn, contacted the lieutenant governor. So we had a conference call, uh, the three of us, Alex, George, and myself, along with MEMA's chief, Mike Womack, and some other MEMA officials, and the lieutenant governor, uh, and one other senator. In fact, we, we had a conference call, and we talked about what do we need to do to make sure that everybody's coordinated, and, and that's kind of what happened. And, and the big thing that we've all agreed was to make sure that every claim, every request for assistance comes through our county emergency management mm -hmm. agencies. Because if some people gave them to the legislators, or some gave them to sheriff's office or some gave them to Red Cross, uh, some went straight to FEMA, you're going to have a hodgepodge of relief efforts. But if you can have everybody channeled into one area, then you can make sure that everybody's claims are being processed the right way. Everybody that needs emergency assistance is going to get taken care of in the right way. And we don't have to worry about you know, one person having four different groups coming on their behalf and some person getting nobody coming to their assistance. Now, when we talk about District 23, mm -hmm. that's Warren County, Issaquina County, and part of Yazoo, or is that a that's good That's correct. Point? Okay. Yeah. And that's the areas, that's your district. Correct. So, 
that's a lot of water in your district. It, it is. I mean, I, I told you before we started that this district is, unfortunately, the district that's taking the brunt of the flooding. Um, you know, Issaquina is in trouble. Yeah. Uh, certainly, we, we pray the levees don't break. We're all in trouble if the levees break. But Issaquina has got a lot of backwater flooding. Of course, the Big Spur, Warren County area is getting tremendous flooding. And the Yazoo River is flooding now. It's it's come up over its banks and it's flooding a lot of farmland. Um, there's not as much industry in the Issaquina and Yazoo areas. You know, we're losing some industry right now in the Vicksburg and Warren County area because um, we've had some two casinos that have shut down. We've got some other businesses on the riverfront that have shut down. Uh, and of course, the big thing is so much farmland lost in those three counties. I mean, and this is going to be a major hit to our farm and crop production. What do you think that economic hit is going to be for this area and how long it's going to take us to recover? Yeah, I, I couldn't tell you how significant the hit's going to be. I know it's going to be a hit. Yeah. I mean, one, if there is a silver lining in this, uh, I think we're seeing a lot of construction activity right now, which will help ease the pain a bit in those those companies that are doing construction work are employing people and uh, certainly their revenues should be up this year and hopefully that's going to help everybody as, as you know, that increases our tax base. Uh, but your farmers having their um, crops out of production has the, you know, that could raise food prices, um, mm -hmm. could raise fuel prices, uh, just things like the Bungie ethanol plant, you know, Oregon Bungie ethanol plant where they've got uh, used corn to to produce their product, uh, sure. you know, that could be a hit for them. So I can't tell you what the economic impact is going to be, but it's going to be significant. Briggs, I, again, I thank you for your time. Um, is there anything I didn't ask you? You know, sometimes it's hard to interview people. I don't really know the myriad of things you do as a senator and in this community. And um, is there anything I didn't ask you that you feel like it's important um, for people to know about, not, not just about the flood, but in general? Well, about the flood, I would say there are going to be those people that have tremendous property loss, uh, whether it's a uh, crop or it's their uh, home, a car, whatever it is. Uh, again, contact your county emergency management agency to help process your claims. Uh, I know this is a difficult time for you, but make sure that you've got your claims being handled. Any, any emergency assistance you need, make sure that's being taken care of properly. And if people have not registered yet, and they are going to sustain a loss or have, they need to call 1-800-621-FEMA. Go ahead and do that now, get an ID number. FEMA won't be able to come and find you. You need to contact FEMA, correct? That's right, yes, good advice. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you for inviting us to your yeah, office. It's been a great place to do the interview. Glad to have you.